In the pantheon of global central bankers, India's former Reserve Bank Governor Dr. Y.V. Reddy occupies a pride of place. In fact, economist Joseph Stiglitz once said that if Dr. Reddy had been the chairman of the Federal Reserve in 2008, instead of Alan Greenspan, we, the U.S. probably would not have landed in the Lehman crisis. Well, at the moment, the world is in a kind of U.S.-led financial tightening and therefore possibly some crisis. So I have with me Dr. Reddy to understand the global scenario. That's one reason to interview him. But the second big reason to interview him is that his autobiography, Advice and Dissent, is now been published this month in Hindi, titled Vimarsh or Paramarsh. And with that, uh, his memoirs are now available in five languages. I'll read them up. Na uh, Gnapakalu, that is my memoirs in Telugu, Binna Abhipraya, Differing Opinions in Kannada, Daivam Chirikyunna, God Laughs, that's the translation in Malayalam. And of course, the latest Vimarsh or Paramarsh means discussion and consultation. That is in Hindi. Well, Dr. Reddy, thank you very much for giving me your time. Thank you very much, Lata. You've always been very kind to me. Very, very pleasant, very pleasant, always cheerful, charming. I can't say anything more than that. Good. Let's start our series. Okay. Maybe. No, so, you know, your book is available in five languages. Now Hindi. Why Hindi now, sir? Is it because the government is pushing Hindi? The current regime is? No, let me be frank. Uh, I don't think uh, it was timed by me. It was done by the Oxford University Press. Okay. Which has undertaken the publication. And I got into an agreement five years back. Okay. But it took their own time, thanks to COVID, and Oxford, and okay. all that sort of stuff. Therefore, I am not responsible for the delay. For the timing. Uh, okay. For the timing. And therefore, I am also not taking any pro-Hindi or anti-Hindi stance. <laughs> but okay. I do believe that the mother tongue is important. Mother tongue is very important. And that's why I insisted on bringing my book out in Telugu, which is my mother tongue. Okay. And, and I also feel that you may, you may think acquiring knowledge through English, but still you, acquire, you express wisdom. You're wise only when you think of it in Telugu. I said this earlier also. And so third, first Telugu, that's why. Second one was Kannada. Kannada was another thing. In Kannada what happened is that, uh, uh, that Professor Sriram, an eminent economist, now what he did was, he first he read the Telugu book, which he liked it, but at the same time, when the moment English was released, mm. he said this is better because it has a lot of technical also. We should the Kannada people be deprived of technical also. So he married the two in a way as a new product. And okay. again, you can see the title, how it's different. Then there comes third, Professor Thomas. Again, a very economic professor, very nice person, a thorough gentleman. And he gave a lot more importance to family values. If you read In the, the print, Malayalam version. Yes, in fact, the Malayalam version. And as you know, if you, if you look at uh, the book and the preface to the book written by all the translators, you will get this. That if I attach more family to family, I attach more importance to family values. Yes. And then finally, you have the Hindi. Hindi. In Hindi, also, the preface explains why it's very important. And certainly, Hindi is very important for our country. Most important is large population, very large population, Hindi speaking. Second is the age profile. The age profile is a lot more people are younger. So three, at the moment, there's a lot of interest in share markets. So the Hindi belt is becoming conscious. The whole people are, young people also are coming up for concentrating on financial, even for knowledge. It's not available in their own language. Well, uh, since you've given it in many languages, I just wanted to know what do you want to convey and are the translations honest to what you are conveying? Incidentally, I must tell you some of the dilemmas I face, okay. perhaps. As a biographer, when I write my autobiography, first thing is, how much should I disclose? How much is confidentiality? Okay. And what I should keep in mind, uh, just to, do, to make it uh, very dramatic or simply analytically. Mm -hmm. So this is a personal decision I have to take. Okay. And sometimes whenever I felt that public interest does not, Warrant and disclosure was not warrant. It was not scandalize people unless it's such a public interest. Okay. So that's what I thought substantively. Secondly, do, are we catering to the reader or are we catering to myself? Okay. So I have to feel like saying something. I want to say something. And therefore I say, then the reader is not in the picture. Okay. The other is I think of what the reader may like. So that's again another choice. Another dilemma. Right. And third, of course, is that you have got to make a choice between the dialect as I mentioned. 
There are a lot of choices you have to make, a lot of ethical questions that you have to make. For instance, Arun Jaitl pointed out that when the finance minister spoke to me in, 19, in 1988, he did not know that I'm going to disclose to public now. Yes. Is it moral for me to disclose to public now? Yes. These are the issues that come up. That you have to tackle. I agree with you. So, but, uh, you know, uh, for me, in your advice and dissent, the chapters uh, uh, 11 to 15, where you tackle the 1991 crisis, is the most interesting. Uh, you know, the reforms still have a magical quality. Today, uh, since then, do you think we have done anything as uh, dramatic or as paradigm changing as 91? Let me start disagreeing with your first statement. Okay. 1991 magically is not correct appreciation. Okay. The correct appreciation is 1991 is a decontrol era. Okay. It's not a reform, it's decontrol. Okay. Yeah, it's tight control, license control, right? It relaxed the controls. It did not change the law instantly. Most of the law was not changed. So deregulation. Okay. So they used to say, I would not exercise this power. Okay. There are a lot of powers which they are exercising before. Mm. Under the deregulated regime, they started saying, I don't want to exercise this. So the regulations may uh, they are dilutory. Mm. Whereas uh, after 91, actually during the period of Bajpai and Ashwan uh, Sina and Jason Singh, real reform took place in terms of institutional change, law. Fiscal responsibility legislation, FEMA, all these things have been brought about by oh. this. So, in my view, the, and it's not only my view, Shankaracharya, former chief economic advisor, has written a book on this, uh, where he explains how Ashwin Sena was the leader of the reform in India. Okay. So, first, I won't say 1991 is not dramatic, important, important, politically very important to lose the control. That has been done. That's Pino Sokka and Manmohan Singh okay. can take it. But the reform is really Manmohan Singh, not Manmohan Singh, but it's Vajpayee. Uh, Vajpay, uh, and uh, Yashwan Sina and Yashwan Sina. Yeah. Okay, sir. Well, uh, but 1991 still is a paradigm shift in our memory. Uh, let me bring you to the present because I think that's what the world wants to hear from you. Uh, like Stiglitz said, uh, you know, the uh, 2008 crisis uh, was because there was loose monetary policy. Now, the US is tightening very dramatically. About 500 basis points of rate hikes in one year is unheard of. What do you think may be the repercussions? Do you think it will be recession? And uh, what may be the repercussions for a country like India? See, we have to, we have to view the, the perspective. See, 1991 reform was of India because the problems in India is yes. the rest of the world. Not a global, though technically we ascribe it to this uh, oil crisis. Mm. It's not a global in not that sense. Global. It's not our reform. Our headache, basically. When it came to 2008, it's not really us in sense. But it's a crisis of financial sector and North Atlantic, basically, yes. not us. So even that is not that uh, big a challenge. But this time it's a very big challenge. Very big challenge because the whole global system is changing. And in fact, the balances between the state and market are changing. The balances between state and market, the public and private enterprise, between national and global, these things are shaking. And the geopolitical situation has tremendously changed. So this sort of a change which, which is definitely disrupting, but definitely not going to end up easily in any particular solution. Okay. So a huge uncertainty that we're living through. And therefore, I think being nimble-footed is good for our policy. See, better to be cautious than over-optimistic. Okay, be, don't be adventurous. And we should be careful about telling people that there's a real problem. So I don't think it's appropriate for us to create false impressions. Uh, but we should, be, and people are now quite intelligent, they, are, they can understand our position. I think we should, we should really give a balanced view of the challenges. The balanced view is be careful. Okay. But, uh, you know, we often say that we were the fastest growing economy in 2022 and that even after the slowdown to maybe 6%, we will be the fastest growing economy. There is a bit of self-praise uh, uh, when we describe the Indian economy. You think uh, that is dangerous? Is it well-founded? What are the red flags? Let me put it this way. It's not by and large truthful. Nobody can say it's not correct. But you have to also make a distinction. India and its people. India and its people. What's the wealth of India? What's the income of people? Oh. So if we recognize people matter for India, not just India by itself, then have to view it together. And you have to say that this is what India stands for, these are the people. So if you say India will be growing very fast, then you say, well, the per capita income, Bangladesh is growing faster. Okay. So like this, we should keep constantly, at least the readers, and everybody else should keep constantly in, the, in, in mind that things may have to be, you may have to see a little more than you read the newspapers that we put in that way. And therefore, I think things are, certainly I think short term is very bright. Certainly short term is 
very bad. Because again, I think advantage of two situations. One is we are not very well integrated in the globe. Mm. And the globe is Which will work to our right, advantage. Right. So therefore, uh, that's one. And, 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 and secondly, we were ourselves not very much into any ideological position, either politically or economically. We were just somewhere in the middle, left, right, left, right. Left, right. So that ambiguous position of non-commitment to any particular ideology, any particular, we are making advantage, we're taking advantage. And I must compliment the Prime Minister for taking advantage of this particular neutral position, the uncommitted country yes. is giving him a lot of duties now. Oh, okay. yes. Yeah, Even geopolitically. Yeah, geopolitically. That's what I mean. So that's why I would say that, that uh, I think people have to be perhaps far more careful than what they are now mm. about the Indian economy and its prospects. Okay. And the society also is going to put in okay. that. But uh, we do have twin deficits. So now a budget will come up uh, in less than a month. Do you think fiscal deficit should be a worry? We ran up a deficit because of COVID. Uh, should that be a very important consideration, considering that this year we will end with a near 3% current account deficit also? First, let me start with the current account deficit. See, current account deficit definitely influences this, the, the medium term view. Because it's not a current account deficit which determines the exchange market. The exchange market are determined by capital account. Mm -hmm. Capital account transactions. So short term fluctuations are entirely due to. So current account deficit may not be built into day to day movements. Current account deficit will be built into structural. Yes. And also the effectiveness of current account deficit in transmission to the exchange is highly diluted. Because mm -hmm. less for us, supply chain, etc. And therefore, what we have a situation is that current account should be a worry when people assess our fundamentals, mm -hmm. but not for market volatility. For that, I have to look at the capital flows. In the capital flows also, we have we have slight problems also in capital flows because our reserves have been built out of borrowing basically, and more important, the 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 debt portion and particularly the government portion has been increasing a little large now. Okay. So the composition of capital flows requires a careful watch before we attract any more. But at the moment, we are not in danger as far as the current account is concerned. I think I should say that we are, as Rangarajan pointed out in his book. The external sector has been put a firm footing. Mm. And virtually, we have, we have no external sector is no longer a constraint for our policy in the last 30 years. We can be very proud. Okay. We can be very proud. And then you come to the issue fiscal of deficit. fiscal deficit. Fiscal deficit, uh, normally, if the current account deficit is not an immediate problem, fiscal deficit also is not an immediate problem. Again, not because we are great, but simply because most of it is funded and uh, domestic. Domestic, uh, domestic bias by the savers and also institutional exploitation, uh, institutional uh, prescriptions. And then finally, household savings are pretty high. Household financial savings are pretty high. This is a redeeming feature, which always existed, which will continue to exist. That's a, but there is a problem still. The problem is that if we stretch it too far, then it could break down. So we have to be very careful in not stretching it too far. So I wouldn't say, I would not worry about fiscal deficit, but I would certainly worry, but the central government, but the central government. Because people look at central government basically. The macro analysts may prepare, but markets don't look at totality of the deficit, subnational yes. deficit plus. No, there are considerable government of debt, debt, direct and indirect. Mm. No, the, it, at the moment it is 6.4% for the current year. And uh, the government has stated its intent to bring it down to 4.5% by 26. That is 200 basis points in three years. You think it should be front loaded that at least 60, 70 basis points of reduction? is necessary in FY24, you know, sub 6%, bring it to 5.7 or 5.8? Can you believe it? If you see the <laughs> track record of the government of India, I would be hesitant to believe it till it is proven. Okay. Okay. But uh, that, that uh, should be the goal, would you say? That's right. There's no doubt. Stating the goal is okay. But if you not believe yourself, that the goal is reachable okay. quickly. Okay. See, there are two things. One is what you believe in. Second is what... what uh, you're telling others to convince. Okay. This is not necessarily the same. No, but should they aim for something under six? Uh, could be. That could, that could be a question mark. Are you fooling the people too often too much? If you, are, if you fool the people too often too much, the markets also will smell it. There is a danger. But I think so far some balance, not so much balance, less than perfect balance, but I think something the government of India is delivering in terms of transparency. Yes. But not as much as it's claimed, of course. Not, certainly not as much as it's claimed. But I would say, uh, I would say, uh, principle-wise, direction-wise, they are right. The movement is very, very, very slow. 
That is true. Okay, so I have to take a break. But I want to speak about the banking sector to you. In a minute, after this break, reforms in the banking sector. Welcome back to this special chat with Dr. Vaibhi Reddy, former governor, Reserve Bank of India. Uh, the uh, OUP, Oxford University Press, has just published the Hindi translation of his autobiography, Advice and Dissent. The Hindi book is called Vimarsh or Paramarsh. Okay, we've spoken about the book, Dr. Reddy. I want to speak about uh, the banking sector. Of course, in your autobiography, you discuss at length about uh, the start of the reissue of private sector bank licenses and the failures or the disadvantages of, uh, you know, nationalizing of the banks. Okay, now I wanted to ask you about a point which the former uh, chief economic advisor K.V. Subramaniam raises. He points out in his recent book that all countries which have had rapid growth of uh, per capita income, you know, like Korea, Malaysia, have higher bank credit to GDP. Their bank credit to GDP is 150%. Ours is only 65%. So do you think that this is a big drawback and that we need to push more bank credit? And in the, in the first place, why is it that our bank credit to GDP is so low? Thank you very much. My own, uh, in fact, I'm very hesitant to disagree with Dr. Subramaniam because he is a specialist in the banking sector. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but still I can say, from a macroeconomic sense, the wisdom in the world is not settled whether the financial sector leads that the bank credit to GDP it leads or it follows. Okay. The question is whether the growth is because of the credit or the credit is because of the growth. Okay. So it's, it's that you type would of... rather that growth be uh, first uh, and lead? Not, not exactly, but uh, don't think the financial sector can lead the real sector. Right. In the ultimate okay. analysis, it's the real sector which determines the growth of the financial sector. Short term, some... Uh, but why are we so behind others? That's very simple. That's very simple. Uh, public sector banks. Not so. I won't say for nationalisation. Com first, uh, compare uh, for countries of comparable, comparable development. Okay. You expect a distinction of capacity of the bankers and the capacity of, of the, the banking economy. system. See, capacity of the Indians may be great because they're able, they're in financial sector everywhere. But that doesn't mean that our financial system. Are, uh, so, in terms of correlation of the level of development and banking, I'm okay. not so sure. But certainly, I don't think. We should think that by encouraging financial sector, by encouraging banking, you will grow. Simplistic assumption. And this is something which, which happened even when I ran up to 2008. Yes. I had to, I had to address this issue. The point is that we know that the debt to GDP has to raise in order to maintain the growth. But when it has to raise, what should be the... Uh, and again, whenever there's a crisis, you remember, you say that there's a problem with... Uh, Cyclical. Uh, yes. counter. How do you accommodate counter cyclical policy? It's a unidirectional increase in the GDP ratio. And therefore, what we do is what I had I told the gatherings in Switzerland and all that when I discussed. I said, look, my problem is I know that the debt to GDP ratio has to increase. But how should it increase? In some sectors, it should increase. In other sectors, it may be speculation entirely. You see that. Uh, during and for my, us, it also led to the NPA cycle. And during my time, I put maximum restrictions on the real estate. Yes. Is that the correct thing to do or not is the question. Similarly, sectors, you have to differentiate sectors and impact. And most important, it's not the monetary policy that influences the banking system. In the, in the reaction between growth and uh, policies, macro policies, I think the growth is, and cyclical, cyclicality can be addressed not by aggregate monetary policy, but from financial sector regulation. Mm. You have to make it. See, central banks perform two types of functions. So therefore, we have to be very clear, in order, uh, clear. Monetary policy can handle aggregate. And whereas the... Banking regulation. Banking regulation can be used to some extent in allocation of credit. That is what he says. Bank, okay, allocation of credit is one thing. His point is that we have a capital adequacy ratio of 9. Whereas uh, the Basel norm, the BIS norms are 8%. Rest of the world has 8% capital adequacy. So his argument is we should bring it down so that banks can lend more. I but there is the other side which says that because we are doing well now in the banking system and NPAs are low, we should actually impose counter-cyclical buffers. You see, let me put it this way. Maybe he is a little too confident of our banking sector <laughs> as a whole. Or our governance, let me put it very clearly. The loan recovery, so far it has shown, even recently also, the loan recovery is a result of governance. How the governance is maintained, how the uh, law is enforced. On both governance standards and enforcement, we are very weak. As long as we are very weak, don't follow global things in this matter. We have to create our own Indian buffer. 
We have to create Indian buffer funds. So as any, any particular regulators of banking system, we'll have to say that, look, be careful, be careful. Okay. So don't say, say, hey, global standard. You don't have global standard. Of course, you don't have global standard. Just... Okay, okay. We should have global standards of governance also. Uh, so uh, the other uh, issue that is now gaining uh, currency, or it's a very common uh, theme, is climate financing. Now, we have Jerome Powell saying that he is not going to change, uh, you know, orchestrate central bank uh, monetary policy on climate considerations at all. He has clearly said that he's, he has got only one mandate, and that would be inflation and growth, not climate. But uh, India has a discussion paper on climate financing. The Bank of England has gone, uh, you know, has imposed climate conditions on itself. So what do you think? You, do you think monetary policy should be guided by climate financing? Uh, what's your stand? Let me put it this way. See, climate financing is a particular aspect. There's a big problem, a very big problem. And at the outset, let me say that that very, very serious problems for the economy and the society as a whole, then all policies have to work together. To that extent, monetary policy also should work together in terms of climate. But the question is whether the central bank has the capacity, expertise, instruments to do that. We have to be very careful in thinking that we have capacity. I think by structurally, monetary policy is not well equipped. We may not, may not know what's the climate fund, I say. The worst point is giving money is not a development. Sector. So you're agreeing with Powell that uh, climate should not be an input into monetary policy making? No, definitely climate need not be a formal input. But you may not be able to ignore okay. the developments in relation to climate and other, by other regulators. You have to keep it in mind so that you don't do anything counter that. See, it's one thing to say that I take into account climate fund. The other thing is to say I give some appropriate ways as the circumstances warrant. That's the nuance, because from a public point of view, it should not appear that the central bank is uh, away and apart from the societal concern. Okay. If the major societal concern is the climate, the central bank says, okay, I'm also willing to do that. But maybe U.S. being, you see, very often, when the central banker talk, my problem is the central bank talk sometimes with the common man, sometimes with the financial market, yeah. <laughs> sometimes to the intermediaries, so you have to be careful. Okay. So you would say that when you're making monetary policy, you concentrate on inflation and growth, but uh, as a banking regulator, as a, a central banker for the economy, you must encourage climate financing. Not encourage, but basically you should not appear to be not even taking into account, account. a matter of such. It's like crisis. Okay. In a crisis, all policies merge. Okay. Now that when the society recognizes it, all of us will merge. So I would also be add if they, I can hear, like Paul, I can t turn it back and say, please tell me what I can do. Okay. Then the answer is, will come from the people. Okay, okay. Well, finally, uh, Dr. Reddy, I wanted to ask you about what is your view of India's medium term. A lot of brokerages think that this is our decade uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we should be able to easily produce 6 to 7 or even 7 percent growth throughout this decade. Uh, do you think that our time has come and this is going to be our decade? I think Professor Manmohan Singh had tried it once before, if you don't remember, if you recall. When the reform started, Professor Manmohan Singh, this is our time. No, our nobody, time has come. Ah, nobody can. India's time has come. So that, that happened once to Manmohan Singh. It may happen again. This time also. So don't be surprised. It's the same as Manmohan Singh rhetoric. Okay. There is a rhetoric. We have to accept this rhetoric. Maybe sometimes it inspires people. But otherwise, it's very difficult to say our time has come. When you are ranked in terms of poverty of the people, or 130, you are among the 10% of the poorest countries in the world. You can't say India is great, but people are not great. Oh, okay. You would like to concede that. So we have to also be conscious that when you project and I go out to the country, if they say, I say India is great, but I got problems, people are there, large number of poor people, I have to serve them. That is the proper thing to say. Ah. Then say, Kautilya or something. Like <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, sir, to bring, uh, bringing some reality into our vision of ourselves. Thank you. Yes, we have a bright future, but we should remember that we have big problems.